and it's about to gavel in, but it's on Saudi child abduction cases. Why do you think this is happening right now? Well, actually, uh, there are more child abduction cases in Germany than there are in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the, the, this, this is a political thing, not, not, a, uh, not a really uh, substantive issue. Uh, if you are a child of a Saudi, you're a, uh, a Saudi citizen. If you're not uh, a child of a Saudi, uh, take it back. If you were born in Saudi Arabia, that does not make you a citizen. So they go by blood, not by territory. And very often when you have an American wife and a Saudi husband, uh, and she wants to leave him, she wants to take her children, and he says, you can go if you want, but you can't take the children. And it, that's the usual dynamic in which this happens. Either she sneaks him away, the, or the child away, and kidnaps him, which is far more often than the other way around, or, but in a, in, in a couple of highly publicized cases, it's been the other way around, in which the Saudi has gotten back his child, which he thinks he should have custody because in that country it goes by blood and that's sort of the the very quickly the 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 details in which these hearings are supposed to be had i would prefer if they talked about it worldwide because saudi arabia is certainly not the 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 place where most of this happens it's mostly in other places like germany as you can see on this uh, Wednesday morning in December, waiting for uh, members of the committee and the chairman and also uh, some of the witnesses to assemble for it. We're going to bring you live coverage. It's expected to last until noon Eastern time. Uh, Dan Burton again of Indiana, the chair, and among the witnesses will be Pat Roush, who is the mother of American citizens abducted to Saudi Arabia. Uh, also, uh, Eileen Denza, University, of Co University College London, and others. And we thank you for being with us. We're going to take you out of that hearing room for uh, coverage of this hearing this morning. watching public affairs programming on C-SPAN. As you can see, we're waiting for the, the beginning of this House Government Reform Committee hearing on uh, Saudi child custody cases. Chairman Dan Burton of Indiana just walked in the room, and the hearing should get underway shortly.
Good morning, a quorum being present. Uh, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written and opening statements be included in the record without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all written questions submitted to witnesses and answers provided by witnesses after the conclusion of this hearing be included in the record without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that a set of exhibits relating to this hearing be included in the record and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record and without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that, the, that Senator Blanche Lincoln uh, be permitted to participate in today's hearing. We're very happy to have you here and without objection, so ordered. And I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member will allocate time to Committee Council as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes, divided equally between the majority and minority, and without objection, so ordered. Before I make my opening statement, I think it's important that uh, we talk a little bit about uh, some of the problems that uh, uh, has occurred in the last couple of days. Uh, the spokesman for the Saudi Embassy, Mr. Jabbar, has been all over national television indicating that the Saudis are very cooperative and want to work with the United States government in every area possible to make sure that uh, uh, we continue to have a good relationship. And uh, uh, he, he's a very good spokesman. I watched him on Fox this morning and I watched him on some other channels. And, uh, 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 it's amazing how adept he is at, at skirting the truth. But I want to cite just a few examples of where we've had problems as a government and as a committee in getting the truth from the Saudis. The Saudis said that they were not complicitous in kidnapping American children uh, uh, whose mothers had uh, parental rights and had custody of their children. But uh, we know for a fact that the Saudis, even though they had been notified not to uh, give passports to children who were kidnapped. They did. They issued passports to the children of Joanna Tanetti and Margaret McCain, McLean, even though that they knew the American courts had ordered the fathers not to take them out of the country, and, and the embassy had been contacted on some of these cases. And so they lied about that. The Roush girls... Uh, supposedly were on vacation in London during the delegation's visit to Saudi Arabia. That's not so. The Saudis provided a list of kidnappings of their citizens by the Americans that the U.S. should address. That's not so. Drea Davis was kidnapped to the U.S. with the help of the State Department. That's not so. The congressional delegation did not request a meeting with Crown Prince Abdullah. The Saudi government cannot intervene in family matters and urges them to be settled privately. We know that that's not so. Fifteen of the 19 September 11th hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. And I have an article I want to read about that. The Saudis have held telethons to raise money for the families of suicide bombers. The FBI has traced money from a suspected al-Qaeda advance man back to the Saudi ambassador's wife. We have a chart on that. The suspect, Omar Ahmad al Bayami may have assisted two of the hijackers of the plane that hit the Pentagon. He's now missing. Besides oil, their main export is anti-American and anti-Semitic propaganda. They funded the extrem extremist Madras in Pakistan and Afghanistan that created the Taliban. And Prince Nayib bin Abdulaziz, Minister of the Interior, said this less than two weeks ago. 
Quote, I presume there is a link between Israeli intelligence and terrorist organizations to attack Muslims through Islam and Palestine. The media is controlled by the Zionists, and we know that Jews have exploited the September 11th events and were able to turn the American public against Arabs and Islam. The question is, who perpetrated the September 11th events and who were the beneficiaries? And then he says, I think the Jews themselves. He knows full well that the 15, 15 of the terrorists were, were Saudis, and yet he's now saying that the Jews were responsible. Prince Nayev's attitude is pervasive there. When we went on our Codel to Saudi Arabia, we stopped in Israel for some meetings there. The Saudis wouldn't even allow our plane to enter their airspace after taking off from Israel. We had to make a diplomatic stop in Jordan first. And I don't see how they can be seen as reasonable people and allies in the war on terror when they won't even let our airplane fly from Tel Aviv to Riyadh. On the issue of kidnapped American citizens, the Saudis have completely been inflexible. We recently got a letter from the foreign minister. He said, we totally reject anything that damages our Islamic Shara law on which a total system of the state is founded and which one quarter of the population on this earth believe. The Shahara regulates and guarantees all humanitarian rights without any prejudices. It is founded on God's orders, which we follow, as well as the good objectives of Islam, mainly justice. And I'd like to know where the justice is in denying Pat Roush her daughters for 17 years, and where is the justice for harboring uh, kidnappers. And we know that that's been done, and we know they've been complicitous in this. So Mr. Jabbar, although he's very adept at making these statements to the media, and they've done a good job of it this past week, the fact of the matter is there's a heck of a lot that needs to be explained. Now, we have, we have contacted their lobbyists to get information that they may have regarding the kidnapping of these children and the uh, complicitness of the Saudi government. The lobbyists have said that they're protected, and the Saudi government has said that they're protected by the Vienna Convention and that they don't, they're an arm of the Saudi government, and therefore they don't have to give us any documents that they have. That is totally wrong, according to every lawyer that we've talked to that knows anything about the Vienna Convention, and we have some witnesses here today that's going to talk about that. And so we asked the Saudi lobbyists, some of whom have been here before, to come and testify today. Uh, their lawyers said that they didn't want to testify. And so we told them that we would be sending them subpoenas to compel them to testify. Uh, when the U.S. Marshals went to serve the subpoenas, they weren't at their homes, they weren't at their offices, they were nowhere to be found. Now you would say if this was one lobbyist, that would be understandable. But the fact of the matter is there were three lobbyists from three different concerns and they had, none of them were anywhere to be found. And so they have been hiding and I think that that uh, says uh, a lot about uh, uh, the Saudi government and their openness and their uh, willingness to cooperate with the United States government in, in helping us solve problems like these kidnappings and the money that's been going through them to uh, uh, families of uh, terrorists who've blown themselves up in Israel and uh, possibly uh, al-Qaeda cells. And so... Uh, uh, we're very disappointed the lobbyists aren't here, but uh, we will be asking some questions that are relevant to them anyhow. We're meeting, as I said before, to meet uh, today uh, about American children who've been abducted to Saudi Arabia. Um, I don't want to be here today. It's uh, the holidays. Congress is not in session. I don't think any of us, the senator or the uh, congresswoman, uh, would rather be someplace else. But this is very, very important, and so we're here. But I feel we've reached a stalemate on this issue, and I don't think we can just forget about it. We've seen very little progress at all from the Saudis on any of these kidnapping cases. A couple of mothers have received phone calls, and that's about it. The lobbyists for the Saudis, as, as I said, have refused to comply with our subpoenas. The embassies continue to spread disinformation, and that's why we're here holding yet another hearing. One of the most frustrating things to me is that you just can't get a straight answer from the Saudis. Their spokesman had a press conference at their embassy yesterday, and the things he said make it clear that they just don't get it. He said that these cases are private matters, and they have to be dealt with by the families. Well, that's not true. These are American children who were kidnapped in violation of U.S. court orders. In many of these cases, arrest warrants have been issued for the fathers. In at least two cases that we know of, the Saudi embassy helped 
hampers by issuing Saudi passports to the children. And they did it after they were informed that the children were not allowed to leave the country. So the Saudi government aided and abetted the kidnappings, and they are harboring the fugitives. And that's not a private matter. Their government must take responsibility. I want you to listen to what Prince Bandar wrote in the Wall Street Journal in September. Quote, some have charged that Saudi Arabia is holding Americans against their will. This is absolutely not true. I want you to know that's a, that's a lie. I talked to women over there who were absolutely terrified that their husband would even find out that they were talking to us. One woman said, just put us in a box with my kids and stick us in the belly of a plane and get us out of here. And so when the Saudis say that uh, no Americans are being held against their will, they just don't, they don't know. They don't get it. They're, they're, they're misleading. At one hearing alone, we heard from five parents who testified that their children are being held against their will. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Just in case anyone from the Saudi embassy might be paying attention today, I want to refresh their memory. Joanna Tanetti Stevenson, her three children, Rosemary, Sarah, and Abdulaziz, were kidnapped by their Saudi father in August of 2000. Michael Reeves, his two children, Lily and Sammy, were kidnapped by Saudi Arabia, to Saudi Arabia by their mother in July of 2001. Maureen Dabao, uh, her, her daughter Nadia, was kidnapped to Saudi Arabia, Arabia by her father in 1992. Margaret McCain, her daughter Heidi, was kidnapped by her Saudi father in August of 1997. Sam Saramir, her three children, Safia, Maha, and Faisal, were abducted in 1994 by their Saudi father during a brief visit to Saudi Arabia. She has since been reunited with Maha, who was here, but her other two children are still being held in Saudi Arabia. Deborah Dokkow, her two children, Rami, uh, Rami and Suzanne, were abducted by their Saudi father in 1988 during a brief visit to Saudi Arabia. She has since been reunited with her son, but her daughter is still being held against her will in Saudi Arabia. Monica Stowers, her daughter Amjad, has been held in Saudi Arabia since 1986. We met Amjad in August. The Saudi says they gave her a passport and allowed her to leave. But if you hear the whole story of that, how they met, her father married her off to some guy she didn't even know a week before we got there. I mean, the things that the, 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 the hoops they jumped through to keep her from coming to the United States is unbelievable. And it was apparent to me when I talked to her, she was scared to death. Not only that, the religious police came in and threatened our meeting because uh, Amjad's mother didn't have her head properly covered during the meeting. I'm sure she was followed there because they came right in after she got there. Pat Roush, her two daughters, Alia and uh, Aisha, were abducted by their Saudi father in 1986. Instead of allowing her daughters to meet with their mother in the United States, the Saudis sent them to London and pulled a publicity stunt at the very same time we were going over there. They got them out of the country, and they had an entourage of men with them, and the way they were uh, uh, questioned showed very, very, uh, very uh, uh, clearly that they were uh, uh, subjective to the men, because when the men left the room, that was, uh, they, they were in the other room while they were questioned. When they came back in, they put on their abayas, that's those things that cover them from head to toe, and they sat meekly in the back of the room while the husbands answered the questions on whether or not any of the statements could be made public. So they were intimidated, and they should have been allowed to come to the United States and, 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 and meet with their mother and be questioned here, but that wasn't going to happen. Now, those are just the parents who have testified before our committee, and I guarantee you after having been over there myself with committee members, there are many more who are afraid to come forward. Some of them were threatened so severely that when I talked to them over there, it was, it was just, it was unbelievable. I mean, threatened with death and, and dismemberment and, and disfigurement. It was awful. Mr. Al-Jabbar talked a lot about all the progress the Saudis have made. He said they've uh, set up a commission. He said they're working hard. Uh, this is, there's simply one fact they can't hide, and, and that is, according to the State Department, the Saudi government has never returned a single kidnapped American child, not one. Until the Saudis return one of these children, all of their smooth talk is just a lot of hot air. Worse, they are actively working against the interests of some of those who were kidnapped. What happened to Pat Roush's daughter was just a PR stunt her daughters. It's no wonder the Saudis haven't returned any kidnapped children. They can't even answer the most basic questions or they won't. In August, we asked whether Michael Reeves kidnapped children were Saudi citizens or American citizens. Now it's December. Still no answer. Michael Reeves is still waiting to get his kids back. 
We asked where Maureen Dabow's do kidnapped daughter is. The Saudis won't even tell us what country she's in, much less return her. Is that what they call progress? The bottom line is that we just can't get a straight answer from the Saudi government. That's why we issued subpoenas to their lobbyists here in Washington. It's not a step that I really wanted to take, but we've been getting so much double talk and so much stuff on the media that's just not true. We had to try to find some way to verify the statements that are being made. We can't subpoena the fathers who are hiding out in Saudi Arabia. The only avenue to try to find out if we're being told the truth is to subpoena the lobbyists who are being paid to represent the Saudis. And these PR people told us that they are working on the cases, but nothing ever happens. In October, we subpoenaed Michael Petrozulo to come and testify, even though he's a paid representative getting about $200,000 a month from the Saudis. He told us he couldn't speak for them, so we took the next step. We subpoenaed documents from the three main lobbyists who represent the Saudis, which I mentioned earlier. If the internal documents match the public statements, then maybe some of their statements are true. But if the internal documents don't match the public statements, then we'll know the Saudis are trying to mislead the Congress, as we believe they have in the past, the mothers and the fathers and the children of the kidnapped children and the United States public. We've been told so many contradictory things that we have to have some way to assess their credibility. If we can't conduct basic fact-finding and if we can't get the documents we need to, to determine the facts as they really are, then Congress cannot conduct oversight, and it's just as simple as that. The main reason we're here today is that our subpoenas have not been complied with. To those who have observed our investigations over the years, that shouldn't come as any big surprise. I thought we'd heard just about every excuse in the book, but I was wrong. The Saudis have taken the position that their lobbyist documents are covered by the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. I went into that earlier, so I won't continue with that. But I've got to tell you, our lawyers have checked on it. We've talked to lawyers from all of the leading uh, institutions here in Washington and elsewhere, and uh, nobody agrees with the position they've taken. They're simply hiding behind something that uh, they think will work. Today we're going to have Professor... Uh, Elaine Denza of the University College of London uh, here, and I want to read to you a very short quote from her letter of November 18th. Quote, it is my opinion that the records which are subject of subpoenas from the Committee on Government Reform of the House of Representatives are not archives or documents of the Saudi mission and so are not protected on the basis of inviolability from disclosure. Now, this is not a trivial case. This affects a lot more than the committee's investigation. If the Saudis' position stands, and if the documents of anyone who receives money or direction from an embassy are protected from law enforcement or from our government, it's going to have very serious consequences. For instance, the Foreign Agents Rest Registration Act will become a useless piece of paper. Under FARA, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, foreign agents, lobbyists for foreign governments, have to register with the Justice Department. They have to preserve all of their records, which are open to inspection by the Justice Department at any time. Those are exactly the kinds of records we subpoenaed. If the records of the Saudi lobbyists are suddenly covered by the Vienna Convention, what's going to happen the next time the Justice Department wants to inspect them? And these are very serious times we're working in. We've got terrorists around the world. We've got all kinds of things going on, the threat, threat to the American public and our way of life. And if lobbyists can hide these things under the Vienna Convention, then how's our government going to deal with it? One question I wanted to ask the lobbyists that have dodged our subpoena is whether they still have the documents that FARA requires them to keep. If they don't, then they've broken the law. And if they do... We, are, we ought to be able to get them through our subpoena. It's pretty clear that the Saudis have fab fabricated this argument to protect embarrassing documents from disclosure. They can't cite a single precedent, not one, for their claim. In fact, we found out last night that the Saudi government has allowed the Justice Department to access records just like the ones we're seeking, and they've done that in the past. This makes a mockery of their claim. We received a report from the Justice Department's Foreign Agents Inspection Unit. They inspected the records of Saudi lobbyist Frederick Dutton, the report noted that the records were available for inspection and contained many memos from the registrant to the ambassador. The Saudis didn't raise the Vienna Convention then. Why are they raising it now? And that's something our government ought to be very concerned about, probably because they're hiding embarrassing documents. What if an embassy pays someone in the United States to conduct espionage? What would they, th that would make them a paid agent for a foreign embassy. Are they immune from prosecution? Do they not have to comply with lawful subpoenas? That would be the effect of the Saudi position. 
So for all these reasons, we can't let this stand. We have to insist on compliance with these subpoenas and for the sake of this investigation into child abductions and because of these other serious issues that would arise if we let this precedent stand. And that's why I've called before us today the three lobbyists and their legal representative. Now, they're not here. They are hiding someplace, possibly at the Saudi embassy. I want to finish my uh, opening statement, then I'll let my colleagues uh, uh, make a statement. I want to finish my statement by showing a short video. And I want to do this to remind everyone why this is so important. I want everyone to see one more time what Maha Saramir sa said. Now, this is a young lady that uh, was, uh, 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 said one thing in Saudi Arabia because she was threatened. And when she came here and was free to say what she wanted to, she said something entirely different because she wasn't scared to death. So uh, with that, let's roll the tape and, and let the American public hopefully see. Samantha covered herself one last time with the black abaya and along with our cameraman, raced to the hotel where her daughter was waiting. Maybe this is someplace where we can get out of here fast, okay? Okay. So far, it looked as if the plan was going to work. Oh, my God. Minutes later, Maha appeared. But Maha had come out alone. Her sister and brother had been asleep, and she was afraid they'd all be caught if she tried to wake them. Oh, my God. Look at you. You are so beautiful. <laughs> You're a queen. Oh, you're so tired. Don't worry. We bring you home. No. We bring you home. Their plan now is to go to the U.S. Embassy as quickly as they could. But we stopped for a moment at Samantha's hotel. If Maha were to be sent back to Saudi Arabia, she and her mother wanted proof it was against her will. If I had to go back to Saudi Arabia, I would kill myself. I hope everyone got that. If I had to go back to Saudi Arabia, I would kill myself. And yet when she was in Saudi Arabia and was asked questions about whether or not she wanted to stay or leave, she said something entirely different. That just gives you an idea of the kind of terror that these young people and these women live under over there. And I talked to some of these women. And I want to tell you, it's not right for an American citizen to be treated that way by a foreign government. They do not recognize U.S. law. It's Saudi law, and the man rules. A woman can't leave the house. She can't go to the bathroom unless he says it's okay. Now, we did something about that in Afghanistan. We raised cane. A lot of women's groups. I watched Jay Leno's wife talk about the horrible things that were going on in Afghanistan where women were treated like dirt. The same thing goes on in Saudi Arabia. If your ankles are showing, guys walk by the religious police, the Wahhabis, and they smack you on the legs with, with whips. And if you do anything like show your head or face in public, you're subject to going to jail, and you can be whipped up to 40 times with a whip while they hold the, the Koran under their arm. I'm telling you, it's, it, these are things that need to be known by the American people. Now, if the Saudis want to do that to their women over there, their people, I guess there's not much we can do about that. But when we're talking about American citizens and their kids, that's dead wrong. Let's watch now a, 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 a short tape of uh, Drea Davis. Uh, Drea's uh, grandmother and mother paid $200,000 to help her escape from Saudi Arabia after she was kidnapped by her father. They, I think they sold their house or mortgaged their house, isn't that right? Can you imagine that, having to sell your house to get your kid back? Her testimony says it all when it comes to living as a young woman scared and isolated in Saudi Arabia. Play the tape. My father would call me names such as fatso, donkey, stupid bitch, and tell me he wished I would die and burn in the flames of hell. I remember asking my mom if I could jump out of my father's car and run to a policeman for help or try to escape and take a taxi to the American Embassy. My mother warned me not to do that. She told me that not even the American Embassy would help. I could not understand why my country would let me down and not help me. I did not want to be there. I had no right to be there. Yet no one was willing to do anything about it. I was lucky that my grandmother was able to sell her house and give up everything she owned to raise $200,000 for my escape. I was putting myself in danger and knowing that if my father caught me escaping, he would beat me to death. I still risked it. I would have rather died than to have lived as a woman in Saudi Arabia. I, I think those two young ladies 
said it all. And they said one thing in Saudi Arabia and when they were here in a free country. These are American citizens in a free country. They told the truth. And when Mr. Jabbar, Al Jabbar, makes those statements like he has the last couple of days, uh, I, I really get upset because the media, while they try to keep everything as accurate as possible, uh, are providing a forum for this guy, and, 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 and he's, he's, he's talking out of both sides of his mouth day in and day out. And we need to hold them accountable. If they're an ally of the United States, then they should work with us to return American citizens to the United States. And if they're an ally of the United States, they, they should make darn sure that they're not allowing any of their wealth to go to terrorist organizations that are endangering the security of this country. And I, I can tell you right now, they have not been doing that, and I, I doubt seriously if they plan to do it in the future. And that's why our State Department, it's so important that they keep the heat on them. So now I want to conclude my statement. I'm sorry uh, to my colleagues for talking so long. I want to thank uh, Senator Lincoln for joining us today. It's nice for you to come down from the high perch of the United States Senate to join us, but we, we really appreciate it. She has shown tremendous leadership over in the Senate in trying to help families of, uh, of abducted children, and I'm glad that uh, she's here, and I congratulate her for her hard work. She's also uh, talked to Senator Luger and Senator Biden, and she's uh, working very hard to have a hearing over there. So uh, for you ladies who've been suffering, you now have uh, somebody that's uh, beating the drum over there pretty hard, and we're very proud of her and happy she's here. I just wish you were a Republican. And with that, uh, would uh, you like to make a statement, Ms. Lincoln, Senator Lincoln? Well, Mr. Chairman, I first want to commend your leadership on the issue of uh, child abductions and the wrongful detention of U.S. citizens in Saudi Arabia. You mentioned that it's normally a break time for us here in Washington and that uh, everybody is scattered far and, and, and wide uh, as far as our colleagues are concerned. But this is a very important issue, and it is our job to make sure that we continue to address this issue and bring it to the light of the American people and the people abroad to better understand what has happened to these American citizens. You, Mr. Chairman, have been a true champion of the most vulnerable among us, and I am personally grateful for the Chairman's efforts. I think he has led very, very um, well the campaign here to bring about and bring to light the facts that are involved in these very specific cases, but more importantly, in the overall um, uh, dis the overall um, unfortunate circumstances that so many American citizens have found themselves in. And I also appreciate your willingness to allow me to participate in this hearing uh, today to introduce a constituent of mine, Margaret McLean, who I think has done a fabulous job in working with our office and has just persevered under unbelievable circumstances. So I am delighted to join my co former colleagues in the House, um, the fun body. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, delighted to be back over on this side and appreciate the working relationship that we have. And I hope that we can continue that in the new year as we look for bringing up hearings in the Senate and uh, bringing a greater awareness to my Senate colleagues about these issues so that we can combine our efforts and get some results. As I mentioned, Margaret McLean who is with us today, is a resident of Jonesboro, Arkansas. And Ms. McLean's daughter, Heidi Al-Amari, was abducted in Arkansas at the age of five by her non-custodial Saudi-born father, Abdul Basset Al-Amari, and taken to Saudi Arabia in 1997. I'd like to point out that um, Mr. Al-Amari used our system of justice, he used our court systems to gain access to his daughter. In pleading with the judge to ask for those uh, unsupervised visits, he used our justice system and then immediately turned in complete disregard and thumbed his nose at the very justice system that provided him that ability to have those visits with his child. And I think that that is something that we must focus on, is this complete disregard for our justice system that is there to protect our citizens of this country. At the time of the abduction, Ms. McLean had legal custody of Heidi, and Mr. Alomari was permitted unsupervised visitation against the will of, of Ms. McLean, I believe. In July of this year, Ms. McLean was permitted to travel to Saudi Arabia to visit with her daughter, who is now 10 years old, for approximately three hours. Now, my colleague, Congresswoman Maloney mentioned when I stepped up to the dais here, as a mother, 
I could understand these issues. And she is so right. My heart and my prayers, my thoughts and my compassion have gone out not only to Mrs. McLean, but to all of these other parents who have suffered this incredible separation from their children. Prior to this visitation in July, Ms. McLean had not seen or spoken to her daughter since Heidi was unlawfully taken from the United States. Even though I know that Ms. McLean was relieved to see her daughter after five years of separation, her painful experience is something no law-abiding parent should ever have to endure. I have become actively involved in Heidi's case because I'm outraged. I'm outraged that the Saudi Arabian, Arabians continue to invoke its law and its customs to detain my constituent, Heidi al in blatant violation of U.S. law and a valid court order. The very court system that Mr. al used to gain access to his child is now completely disregarded. I recognize that the issue of international child abduction is not limited to Saudi Arabia. We know that there are horrific situations all across the globe. However, the status of female abductees in the kingdom is quite unique, since under Saudi law and custom, women have very limited autonomy and most likely will never have a meaningful opportunity to leave, even as adults, if we are unable to get them as children. And the chairman has made many references to the, the circumstances and the concerns, the problems that these young women and these young girls face as women in this country. Moreover, Mr. Chairman, as I've become more familiar with the specific facts of Heidi's case and others, I have sadly concluded that our own government has failed to represent the interest of abducted children adequately. Perhaps most telling in Heidi's case is the fact that even though Heidi, a U.S. citizen, was kidnapped in August of 1997, our government did not formally ask that she be returned until October of 2002. How inexcusable on our part is that? For too long, it seems, that the U.S. government's goal in these cases has been to maximize visitation and contact between U.S. parents and their abducted children in an effort to avoid confrontation with foreign governments. It is safe to say that neither I nor Ms. McLean are satisfied with that approach. It is absolutely unacceptable. I firmly believe that our policy should be to aggressively seek to recover abducted children who are American citizens being held against their will especially when they are taken to a country that displays contempt for the basic values that we all cherish as Americans. I, for one, am not prepared to accept any result short of the recovery of Heidi from Saudi Arabia. Ms. McLean, I join you in that fight, and you know that I will be there with you. And I will join the rest of these members here as we work towards that end. I'm monitoring the progress of Heidi's case personally, and I fully intend to hold the Saudi government and the Bush administration accountable for bringing this matter to a satisfactory conclusion. I've dis discussed Heidi's case at length with Secretary Powell on the phone. And he has assured me that he will be personally involved in resolving her case. It's my understanding that the Saudi government is currently unwilling to pressure Saudi parents who have abducted American children to comply with valid U.S. custody orders. If the administration is unable to persuade the Saudi government to reverse its position in these cases, I and others are prepared to take steps in Congress to ensure the Saudi government is fully aware that its current policy is absolutely unacceptable. To this end, Mr. Chairman, I was pleased to join you in introducing legislation this year that gives the Secretary of State additional authority to deny visas to the extended family members and employers of child abductors. In addition, I believe the Embassy Sanctuary Resolution we drafted is an important statement that our government is committed to protecting the rights of American citizens abroad. We never want to see that case happen again where American citizens and American children are taken to a U.S. Embassy abroad and denied sanctuary and actually removed by military. 
I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and all of the others again next year on these and other legislative proposals to help resolve parental kidnapping cases worldwide. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I want to express my appreciation to Margaret McLean and to Pat Roush for their willingness to come forward and share their painful stories today. The fortitude and the perseverance they have exhibited under the most difficult of circumstances is truly inspiring to all of us. I believe the hearing you've convened today will shed light on one of the many obstacles they face in being re reunited with their children. And while I'm not intimately familiar with every detail of the subpoenas at issue today, I share your concern about the broad scope of the privilege being asserted and how that could impede in the future our ability in Congress to pr protect the rights of citizens, American citizens, now, in the future, and certainly in terms of our own security in this country. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your unbelievable tenacity in this issue and in working through this. And I'd like to remind all of us, and especially the Saudis, who we would like to see as an ally and as a friend, as a good neighbor that we could work with in many of the, the compromising situations we see across the globe today. But I must remind all of us that a friendship and an alliance is built on mutual respect. And until we can gain the same kind of respect for our laws and our citizens, as we provide to those Saudis that live in their own country in respect for their law and a respect for their customs. It's going to be hard to understand any type of friendship that will take us forward in the 21st century. So I hope that we can gain that respect and that working relationship with the Saudi government to move forward and bring resolution to these heart-wrenching situations and, and cases that we have seen and that we have heard from these incredible women today uh, and in the past. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to be a part of this, and I look forward to working with you next year as we continue in our, in our, our, uh, our struggle to make sure that the American people and the Senate and the House are doing all that we can to assist these families. Well, thank, thank, you. thank you, Senator Lincoln. I'd just like to say that uh, if the Saudis are paying attention, and I have a sneaking suspicion they are, that uh, this is not a partisan issue. We have Democrats and Republicans who agree 100% on this. I think it's a vast majority of both the House and the Senate. And uh, so uh, they, 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 they ought to be aware that this is not an issue that's going to go away and they're going to have to address them. And with that, my good friend Mrs. Maloney is here and uh, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to uh, uh, applaud your extraordinary leadership on this issue and the vaccines, for personally going to Saudi Arabia and meeting with the children, for introducing legislation and for continuing uh, to work on this even as we are in break. And to my good dear friend and former colleague, we came to Congress together, Blanche uh, left to have her two children and I'm so uh, really happy that you've uh, come back to the Senate and she has introduced the Burton Bill in the Senate and not only will she be helping Heidi return to her money to her mother, but this broader bill will really help all American children get back to their homes. And I think that's uh, very, very important. And I'm very, very proud to be working with Mr. Burton as the lead uh, Democratic sponsor on H.R. 5715, which works to help these parents whose children have been abducted and taken overseas. This bill expands the classification of who can be denied visas from the immediate family of uh, child abductors to the extended family and employers in order to put pressure on the abductor to resolve these cases. I would like to further note that we have heard testimony from former Ambassador Mabus that denying visas to the families of abductors can put pressure on the abductors. And unfortunately, Ambassador Mabos left the U.S. Embassy shortly after instituting this policy. We hope to pass this bill in the next Congress and, and uh, have this as a policy that will help uh, families, American families. I, I, after all this moving testimony on Heidi and, and the two films that Mr. Burton showed, I, I really want to remind everyone uh, why we are here today. And we are here to debate 
whether or not these three public relation firms representing the Saudi government must release the subpoena documents. But we must not forget that the real reason we're here is because American children have been torn apart from their parents and are being held against their will in a foreign country that does not observe the many rights American citizens enjoy in our own country. I have said over the course of these hearings that our witnesses have presented uh, wrenching accounts, and I would like to thank uh, the two witnesses today for your willingness to share them with us. I, I would uh, like to state that I believe the Government Reform Committee acted well within its jurisdiction when it requested the documents in question. Over the course of these hearings, we have been unsatisf unsatisfied, to say the least, with the level of, of cooperation and amount of information provided to us by the Saudi government. At times, information has been withheld. In other cases, information has been patently false. This is unacceptable. I strongly believe that if there is one sentence in all these documents that might help return one child to his or her mother, then these records must be released. Secondly, the Saudi government has provided a weak interpretation of the Vienna Convention to support their case. The Convention has rules and procedures that govern the priv privileges and immunities of diplomatic missions. However, there is nothing in the treaty which would extend these diplomatic privileges to outside agents of the mission. In other words, these three lobbying firms should not be accorded any special privilege under the Convention. In addition, these three firms are registered under the Foreign Agents of Registration Act, known as FARA, which requires registrants to keep records and preserve written communication so that these records can be made available to the Justice Department upon request. The Saudi government claims that if there is any discrepancy between the Vienna Convention and FARA, the Convention should take precedence. To that I say that FARA has been in place for over 60 years and has proved critical over the years, and I am certain that these three firms were aware of the requirements of FARA, and I am disgusted by their decision to deny U.S. law and to, to, to not comply. Finally, uh, we are in a period when our countries require greater cooperation and greater disclosure of information. While I am troubled by the Saudi government's refusal to release these documents, I am hopeful that we can work together to achieve uh, greater cooperation, transparency, and ultimately to resolve these tragic family situations. These families, these children have a right to know what is contained in these documents, and I look forward to the hearing. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I would like uh, permission to place into the record an article that is in, in the, uh, this is the Washington Post today. And I think it's directly related to what we're working on today, and it's called Saudis Deny Dragging Feet on Terrorism. And if they can deny information on domestic individual cases, then they can deny information on alleged activities of their charities, on alleged activities of funding uh, suicide bombers, and other uh, information that has been disturbingly uh, exposed, really, by the, the press in this country. And I feel that it is, is, is extremely important to the families, but it's also uh, important on our, uh, in our cooperation in our, in our fight against uh, uh, terrorism. So again, I thank you for really putting, uh, putting uh, you didn't put just one finger in, you know, the old game, hokey pokey. You put your whole, fan, you put your whole body into this issue and, and have been working very hard on it. And, and uh, we all appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Maloney. You're going to have to explain to me what that game was. I, Don't you I'm know how the game? You put one finger in, you put one finger out. The hokey one, pokey? Yeah, you put one foot in, you put one foot out. You put the whole body in. <laughs> okay. <compliment>. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Holmes Norton, how are you? It's nice seeing you All today. Know this game. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'll rescue you that, from that <laughs> lesson you were about to receive from our good colleague. Um, let me first thank you, Mr. Chairman, for what can only be called tenacious uh, work and follow-through uh, on uh, an issue where you have been resisted uh, at every turn. I, I think that your failure to be deterred 
uh, sends an important lesson to the Saudis, a lesson that I hope the committee and the Congress will follow through on in the, in the next Congress, and especially as we learn more, as we will today, uh, about the consequences of Saudi action. Uh, I think you are going, we are all going to see a response from the American people that uh, will, will, uh, that can't even move the Saudis. And I say that, Mr. Chairman, because the, the, I recognize that the timing of this hearing is entirely coincidental. But I think we have seen what the Saudi government will do when there is, in fact, pressure. The firestorm that erupted about um, funds that apparently made their way from the ambassador's wife to the, the realm of the hijackers and the outrage of the American people on that uh, brought forth uh, the foreign policy advisor, Mr. Al-Jabbar, to voluntarily offer up, apparently yesterday, all kinds of information about uh, funding about uh, uh, about how, how what the Saudi Saudi Arabia so, what the Saudi government has done uh, to trace these funds and uh, to make sure that these charities uh, are are in fact uh, not uh, contributing to terrorism. I haven't seen this document. But I, I do know that they weren't willing to say very much about this until, uh, in fact, this caught the attention of the press and of the American people. Now, you know, there was a lot of spin in Mr. Uh, Al-Jabbar's um, press conference, and he is a master of that. He uses the English language better than most Americans, and when he slips, he says, oh, you have to forgive me, my English is a little rusty. Um, this is a man who is absolutely and totally immersed in American culture. Um, he must understand, and indeed the entire sophisticated uh, Saudi power structure must understand, therefore, because of their familiarity with our country, how outrageous these crimes are. And what we are dealing with are certainly crimes. We are taught that you've got to understand that when you go into these countries where people have different cultures, we, 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 we can't change people's cultures by ourselves. I couldn't agree more. I think we have to follow the lead of those in those countries who would change those cultures. But Mr. Chairman, they are now messing with our culture and with our children and with our laws. This is no longer a case of you're, you're dealing with the Saudis and how they deal with things. They have not only implicated us in our laws, they are in direct violation of our laws. They've shown no respect for our people as American citizens. Um, they have enslaved some of our children, kidnapped uh, some of our children and their families forced marriage on some of our children. The notion that we would abide this and that our own government would be complicit in it is a complete and total outrage. Now, your hearings, Mr. Chairman, have subpoenas in the world that they refuse to honor may not do uh, because that exposure, I think, is ultimately going to get the kind of response uh, from the American people that the scandal about the funds of recent days uh, got with some, with, with some results apparently from the Saudi government. Um, I regard this issue involving our families and our children as a real test for the Saudis and their relationship to the United States of America. They claim to be allies. They have indeed been allies in many ways. There is a kind of reciprocal dependence. We need their oil. We need their bases. Uh, this is not, in, in all such relationships, you look for a win-win. When it comes to our children and what has happened to these families, this is a win-lose. Uh, the State Department has can cite 
no single instance in which a child has been returned. That's what I mean by win-lose. We are losing 100 percent. Now, what are we going to do about it? Well, Chairman says, let's subpoena the records uh, and we get the kind of legal obfuscations that perhaps we should have uh, expected. I expect that a number of things will happen. Um, uh, there may be a way to turn to the courts and get damages and other remedies from the courts. There must be treaty obligations involved here. Uh, this is an ally where we must have all manner of treaties. When those kinds of, of violations occur, surely there are remedies that our government can be forced uh, to pursue. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, there is about to commence an independent investigation of 9-11 that members of the oversight committees in the House and Senate recently uh, uh, opposed, that the President of the United States opposed. Why is there going to now be an independent investigation of 9-11? Because the families who were victimized by 9-11 demanded it. I regard this as an issue which can be resolved if the families who've come forward today, the families that we've heard from before, and the other families implicated do for this issue what the 9-11 families have done to get an a, uh, independent investigation of the events uh, and the responsibility leading up to 9-11. Uh, and, and so I don't think we should be discouraged uh, that we don't get voluntary cooperation from the Saudi government or from those involved. I believe that your work, Mr. Chairman, in bringing the families forward, the public exposure that gives this issue so that the American people can understand what is happening will lead to a resolution of this issue if we continue to do the work that you have uh, begun. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Holmes, Holmes Norton. It's very nice seeing you again today. Uh, we'll now go to our witnesses. Uh, would you all rise, please, to be sworn? Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Be seated. Well, uh, we've had uh, you, Ms. Roush, and Ms. McLean here before. Uh, welcome to Professor Denza. Glad to have you here. Uh, we'll uh, start with you, Mrs. Roush, and let you make a, an opening statement, then we'll go to you. And then, uh, Professor, we'd like to hear from you about the... Uh, claims made by the uh, by the lobbyists. Ms. Rausch. Good morning, Chairman Burton and members of the committee. It is once again an honor to bring my testimony before this distinguished body in regards to this committee's continued efforts to assist American women and children who are in grave danger inside the walls of Saudi Arabia <clears throat> and are unable to come home to the United States of America. This hearing, which concerns the Saudi Embassy claim of privilege in instructing its lobbyists and public relations specialists to not turn over subpoenaed documents to the Committee Concerning Abducted American Citizens, is of the utmost importance in helping to reveal the truth about the role of these firms who do the bidding for the Saudi Arabian government. For 17 years, my daughters and I have been victims of the gamesmanship played by the Saudi government, State Department, and Saudi handlers. It all started almost from the very beginning of the kidnapping of my daughters in 1986. My past experiences in dealing with the paid representatives of the Saudi Arabian government. Let's begin with Saudi national Salah El Hejalan. His name was sent to me by the State Department just six months after my daughters were kidnapped. They advised me there was nothing they could do to get my daughters out of Saudi Arabia, and I had no recourse except to hire a Saudi attorney and go to Islamic court to try to win custody of my U.S. citizen daughters. The State Department knew very well that I would never win in an Islamic court in Saudi Arabia as an American Christian woman, but prodded me to hire an attorney who assured me from the very beginning that he was very well connected to the king's brother, Prince Salman bin Abdulaziz, governor of Riyadh. In fact, he gloated that he was a member of Salman's court 
and that his brother was the Saudi Minister of Health and another relative was the former Saudi ambassador to the United States. In other words, the State Department had recommended that I hire a member of the Saudi government to work to get my daughters back, when in fact the State Department should have been doing everything they could to bring these young girls home. It's like being told by your commander that you have to go to the enemy to save you because, sorry, we're not going to help you. Due to pressure raised in the U.S. Congress by former U.S. Senator Alan Dixon, the Saudis, through Hegelon, proposed a plan to have my daughters released from Saudi jurisdiction and returned to U.S. soil. Hegelon enjoyed a pristine relationship with the U.S. Embassy in Riyadh and suggested that he be endowed with the title of quote, special legal advisor, unquote, to the embassy in order to work for the release of my daughters. When the U.S. Embassy Riyadh suggested this to the State Department, Washington replied that this was totally out of the question. Hegelon could never, never, never have that title. Then the State Department double-crossed me at the 11th hour of the final negotiations for the release of my, my girls and refused to send the then U.S. Ambassador, Walter Cutler, into a meeting to finalize the release of my daughters and inform the embassy to, quote, remain neutral and impartial, unquote. Hagelon crowed, quote, your government won't help you, your State Department doesn't want you. You will see your children if and when we decide, unquote. Then he proceeded to bring a camera crew inside the villa where my daughters were being held and told them to make statements about how they hated me and the United States. When the girls refused to comply, they were taken into a back room and threatened. This was told to me by a witness at that taping. Former U.S. Consul General Richard LaRoche, who sat by and merely observed as these two little girls, then four and seven years of age, were intimidated and scared by Hegelon and the nine other men he brought into that villa to make the tape. That was the first time the Saudi government and their retainers coerced my daughters to disavow their mother and country with the complicity of the Department of State. In 1995, nine years later, U.S. Embassy Riyadh Consul General Gretchen Welch informed me that Hegelon had at last been bestowed the title of, quote, legal advisor, unquote, to the U.S. Embassy, and that, quote, everyone around here values his opinion, unquote. How could a Saudi who works for the Prince of Riyadh be a legal advisor to the U.S. government? And if the State Department was going to honor him in this way, why wouldn't they do it when, when it when it would have made a great deal of difference in the outcome of the negotiations for my daughters? Over the years, Hegelon continued to use everything he could to double-cross me and cause me an incredible amount of pain. He penned letters of gratitude, praising himself and faxed them to me, claiming that if I did not sign them, I would not be able to see my children again. Time after time, he placed me in a position of a supplicant on my knees to beg for what is mine, the bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Then there was a setup regarding Walter Cutler and the hold I asked Senator Dixon and Senator Elms to place on Cutler's second confirmation as U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia after Hume Haran was expelled from the kingdom in 1988, persona non gratis. Another betrayal and double cross with the assistance of Walter Cutler and the State Department. Hegelon also worked with Weish Fowler to perform dirty trick after dirty trick upon me, including the fabrication and creation of false documents, phony visits, and endless lies and ruses. At one point, he screamed at me, quote, you are being punished for going to the politicians and the press, unquote. He still tries to get involved with these kidnapping cases, as recently as last summer after the Government Reform Committee hearing on June 12th, Hegelon contacted Monica Stowers in Riyadh and had a deal for her. He might have even had a hand in that whole million-dollar bribe episode and the underhanded scheme to take Amjad Redwan into the marriage with a Saudi Air Force pilot. Next, we have Fred Dutton of the Washington law firm of Dutton & Dutton. Mr. Dutton has represented the Saudi Embassy for almost two decades. 
He has been instrumental in working with Saudi Ambassador Prince Bender, Saudi Foreign Advisor to the Crown Prince Adil Jaber, Rehab Masood of the Saudi Embassy, and others in trying to discredit and marginalize me. He met with former U.S. Senator Alan Dixon in May of 1987 and told, told him in no uncertain terms that if Geshayan was deemed an unfit father to my daughters, the girls would never, never be returned to me, but rather given to another male relative of the family. Even a few months ago, he told my attorney that I had caused a great deal of pain and anguish to many people at the Saudi Embassy in Washington. He repeatedly blocked negotiations, including the deal to release my girls in 1996 with former U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Raymond Mabus. <clears throat> then in 1998, when I was organizing a press conference at the National Press Club in Washington regarding violations of human rights by the Saudi government, and had invited various parents of victim children and a former U.S. diplomat that was assigned to the U.S. consulate in Jeddah, I met with the Saudi torture lobbyist group Hill and Knowlton. I had discovered that many of the rooms at the National Press Club had been reserved by Hill and Knowlton for the same day that our press conference was scheduled. I thought it was more than coincidental. Shortly after that, I began receiving emails from Jim Jennings, Director of National Practices at Hill and Knowlton. His email states, I have seen recent email traffic about your concerns over meetings at the National Press Club next week. You are mistaken if you believe in any way, shape, or form that our company is involved with this matter or representing any aspect of the government of Saudi Arabia on any matter. I have been with this firm for 25 years and do not remember a time when, I, when we have ever represented the Saudis, yet you stood, state boldly in your email that we do. Although Mr. Jennings denied that his firm ever represented the Saudi government in any shape, way, or form, Hill and Nolte is mentioned in the book Agents of Influence by Pat Chope. I'd like to read to you a piece from the December 15, 1992 Houston Post. Human rights abusers pay lobbyists millions. Nations that abuse human rights pay millions every year to Washington insiders, Republicans and Democrats alike. Seeking foreign aid and special treatment from the U.S. government, says a report due out today, U.S. taxpayers are indirectly supporting the activities of lobbyists, lawyers, and public relations firms who were paid more than $24 million in 1991-92 to to represent foreign interests that are persistent abusers of human rights, concludes a report by Center for Public Integrity. <clears throat> but I have to say that in my 17 years of fighting Saudis and their torture lobbyists, retainers, and mouthpieces, this last experience with Corvus Communication has been the most shocking and blatant disregard for human life I have ever seen. It was not even covert. They didn't even do it to me behind closed doors like Hegelon and Dutton and then just walk away smirking. No, this time, Adel Jaber and Corvus, Gallagher, and Patton Boggs felt so arrogant, so smug, and so confident that they could pull off this scheme in London with my daughters as their little pawns to move around the planet anywhere and any time they wanted. They, so to speak, pulled it off in broad daylight. Michael Petrozulu of Corvus testified in October that the Saudi government has been trying so hard to convince my daughters to come to the United States to visit me, but they just couldn't talk the girls into it. Nope. But the girls had a great idea to go to London at the same time members of the U.S. Congress were in Saudi Arabia trying to free them. Petrozulo also stated that he only knew about the London trip two days before the girls were taken there. Does Petrozello know that perjury is a crime? Does he know that his dealing, he is dealing with flesh and blood? How far would the Saudi officials and Saudi retainers take this cruel and treacherous game to destroy me and my daughters? What's next in line for us? Murder? Will we be accidented or suicided? Or is there better punishment for all of us to continue to force my daughters to remain in Saudi Arabia for the entire remainder of their lives and never leave, having a baby each year and live lives of total submission and servitude to the males their father sold them to, with absolutely no freedom and no choices at all. The Saudi officials and American traders who do their bidding for them just had to come with, up with a plan to finally stop me, shut me down. 
I'm sure they all sat around some plush office like the one Margaret Maureen and I were in at Hilton Noten, or perhaps it was out at Bender's Palace in McLean on the Potomac, where they kicked around this little hatchet job on me and my daughters, Congressman Burton and the Codell. They felt so positive that no one could stop them, that they even chose to do the deed the very same weekend that members of Congress had journeyed to Saudi Arabia to ask the highest Saudi authorities for the release of my U.S. citizen daughters and others like them who were locked up in that treacherous prison known as the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Did they know that these plans involved criminal acts committed by Saudi nationals against U.S. citizens and should not have been taken so lightly? Al Jaber had been salivating to make this happen for months, ever since the June 12th hearing. First, he went to Bern, State Department Near Eastern Bureau. In July, Randy Carlino of American Citizen Services called me and stated that Jaber told Burns that my daughters would be available to meet with U.S. Embassy Council Affairs in Riyadh concerning a statement where they wanted to live. But this statement had to be made public. I asked Carlino what Burns told Jaber. Quote, he said he would, it would appear to be staged. And then I asked Carlino if Burns had told Jaber that these were two American citizens and that the U.S. State Department wanted returned as soon as possible. Carlino stated that Burns had not mentioned that to Jaber. Then while the CODEL was making plans for the trip to Saudi Arabia and the Saudis and their guys downtown were planning all these television appearances for Jaber to try to make them look good, Jaber popped up on television personality Bill O'Reilly's O'Reilly Factor on August 9th. I had been a guest on the Factor earlier in the year and O'Reilly asked Jaber if my daughters were being held against their will in Saudi Arabia. Jaber answered, of course not. And then O'Reilly offered, uh, and then Jaber offered O'Reilly a chance to interview my daughters. Jaber knew he'd hooked his fish. O'Reilly's producer, Christine Cotta, called me. I told her that was absolutely not to be done. It was just what Jaber had wanted and needed to destroy my girls. O'Reilly called me the next day and I told him to stay out of it. I offered to meet Jaber on national television on O'Reilly's show, and O'Reilly informed me that Jaber declined to get on television with me and referred to me as a enemy of the kingdom. I never heard from O'Reilly again, and I assumed the matter was put to rest. I was wrong. Labor Day weekend, while the Codel was in Saudi Arabia to ask the Saudi authorities for my daughters to return to me in the United States, O'Reilly, Fox Television, the Department of State, an Associated Press Arab woman reporter, who had written many, many favorable articles about Saudi regime, plus Adel Jaber, his brother Niall Jaber, who works for the Saudi embassy, and Corvus Communications were all very busy directing, producing, and participating in the Stalinistic show trial of my innocent daughters that was taking place in London at the Langdon Hilton Hotel, forcing them once again at gunpoint to disavow their mother and the United States. Ali and Aisha had not been allowed to leave Saudi Arabia since they were kidnapped in 1986. When I saw my daughters in Riyadh in 1995, Alia told me that they never left the kingdom. They were never taken to Europe on vacation like their friends were. Their father was wanted by Interpol and did not travel. And he kept his promise to me that Ali and Aisha would never be allowed to leave Saudi Arabia. But that was until Adel Jaber and Corvus and the others got involved with this scheme. On August 31, 2002, I'd spoken to Chief Counsel Jim Wilson, Chairman Burton in Arabia. A few minutes after that phone call, the State Department called me to inform me that my daughters were somewhere in Europe. Carlina wouldn't tell me what country they were in. Since neither Mr. Wilson nor Congressman Burton had mentioned anything about the girls in Europe, I was perplexed. He asked my permission for a U.S. Embassy Counselor officer to take down a statement from my daughters. I said no, as I had done in July. No other information was given to me. Carlino never mentioned the Saudi government involvement in this matter. The next day, a reporter friend had called me and read the official statement to me that was released by the State Department regarding my daughter's alleged, what my daughters allegedly told them at the Langdon Hotel. Unbeknownst to me at that time, Ms. Diane Andrick, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Consular Affairs, had given the order for Acting U.S. Consul General Margaret Higgins at the U.S. Embassy in London to make the visit to the girls' hotel suite. And who had contacted the State Department to make this request? Adel Jaber, supposedly on August 30th. We still don't know who gave Diane Andrick the order for the London Embassy meeting with the girls. Was it the Secretary of State himself? When the State Department was asked via written questions by the Committee for Government Reform while, why Alia and Aisha did not make the request themselves, the response was that neither Alia nor Aisha spoke English, that this was simply not true. When I visited my daughters in 1995 with the assistance of U.S. Secretary, U.S. Ambassador of 
to Saudi Arabia, Raymond Nabis. My daughter, Alia, spoke English very well and has 100% comprehension of English. So if she really wanted to make her wishes known to the American Embassy in London, she, had, she could have called them herself. Instead, her husband called Niall Jaber, Adel's brother, who then called the U.S. Embassy in London after Adel Jaber had personally made the arrange arrangements with Washington for the London meeting. Then Corvus sent one of their employees from the Washington office, office Shireen Songier, who called herself, quote, a Saudi, Saudi media specialist, unquote. She sat in on the interview with Fox Television, giving my daughter's head signals as to how to answer questions. This minder was there to be sure that the girls didn't say anything that the Saudi government or their paid retainers didn't want them to say. The Associated Press reporter Donald Nasser told my daughters, told me that my daughter Alia exclaimed, I don't want to go to the United States or see, see my mother. And then Aisha chirped, we want her to leave us alone and will not rest until she is dead. This is the same daughter who one year ago bravely defied her father and told me on the telephone, Hello, Mom. I love you, Mom. I love you. I love you. Abul Nasu also stated that Alia had dark circles under her eyes, and the girls jumped when there were two separate knocks on the door of the hotel suite, one room service and then maintenance. O'Reilly's producer told me that Aisha seemed confused about why they were taken to London and why all those people were paraded into the hotel suite to talk to them. But Alia knew what was going on. I can imagine her lying awake at night, knowing that she was in a free country at last, and knowing that there was no way for her to get away from all those Saudi men. What was she to do? Tell the London Embassy representative that she and Aisha wanted to get out of there? She knew she could never trust the American Embassy or anyone connected to them. They were trapped, whether inside the despotic kingdom or guarded in a hotel suite in London. When Fox asked Aisha what they were going to do in London, she replied, visit Big Ben and go to the cinema. This was the same line Joubert had told William McGurn. The script was rehearsed down to the last detail. Poor Aisha hadn't been to the cinema since she was three years old when I took her and Alia to see E.T. here in the United States. There are no cinemas in Saudi Arabia, and Aisha, cloistered up in the kingdom, I'm sure never heard of Big Ben. Not only were Alia and Aisha kept in this little Saudi hothouse controlled environment in a hotel suite in London, by the men their father sold them to, their father and his brothers, as was told to be by the O'Reilly producer, but also the Jaber brothers who worked for the Saudi government. For 17 years, the Saudi government has been stating that their Islamic law forbids the government to get involved with these private family matters. But this public relations stunt in London was written and directed by Corvus and maybe the others, produced by the Saudi officials and Jaber, and taped by the American media under the full blessings of our own U.S. Department of State. Saudi Foreign Minister Saud bin Faisal sent a recent letter to the Government Reform Committee stating that there should be a clear and joint vision whose first priority would be the interests of our children and guarantees their life with freedom and security. He also went on to say, I wish to explain and I wish to explain and ascertain that the government of Saudi Arabia had nothing to do with the travel arrangements. You should know that the meeting was initiated by the husbands of the two Geshayan girls themselves. So who are we to believe? The State Department states in their written, written questions to the Committee for Government Reform that Adel Jaber called Washington, NEA Bureau, and made the request for the London meeting. Adel Jaber told William McGurn of the Wall Street Journal that he had made all the arrangements. Michael Petrozulo testified that Jaber had the idea when he was on the O'Reilly program. And now the Saudi foreign minister sent a letter stating that the men that married my daughters were the ones that initiated the travel arrangements. And the Saudi-owned Arab News states that the Saudi government bore the expenses of their travel with their husbands and children to London in order to allow them total freedom to speak. In a letter to Chairman Burton, El Faisal continues to hide El Faisa continues to hide behind their stated belief system as though they are all anointed and far too holy to be questioned about their actions. He says, what is really surprising is that you use unacceptable allegations against the kingdom and its Islamic Sharia laws. Therefore, we totally reject anything that damages our Islamic Sharia on which a total system of the state is founded and in which one quarter of the population of this earth believe. This Sharia regulates and guarantees all humanitarian rights without any prejudices. It is founded on God's order, which we follow, as well as the good objectives of Islam, mainly justice, unquote. I am really sick and tired of these criminals 
This Saud family who took the Arabian Peninsula by force after World War I and all their de degenerate descendants who have stolen the money from the oil revenues from the indigent, indigent people of Arabia to continually hide behind this Wahhabi belief system and shove it down the throats of the West as though they are a saintly, devoutly religious, righteous men who uphold justice, freedom, and truth. Quite the opposite is true. Just review the human rights record of this sadistic regime with their secret police, religious police, military police, and torture chambers. This regime, who takes their own people's money, has nothing to do with freedom or any of the virtues or high principles of mankind. This continual posturing and lying is absurd. Yesterday, Adil Jaber held a press conference at the Saudi embassy to do some damage control on the Haifa incident. Petrozula was coordinating, of course. Jaber continued to state that there are only four cases of Saudi abductions. This is a blatant lie. There are hundreds of American women and children in Saudi Arabia that are prevented from leaving. They are afraid of the men that rule them and the Saudi government. How can you compare Germany and Western Europe with the repressive evil tortures done to these people inside Saudi Arabia? When questioned by a reporter concerning the subpoenaed documents, Jaber stated, is Chairman Burton serious about dealing with child custody case or is he engaged in a publicity stunt? Joubert and his servants are the experts in publicity stunts, not Dan Burton. I haven't met a man of Dan Burton's caliber and integrity on Capitol Hill since former U.S. Senator Alan Dixon retired. He has been working to free American citizens held hostage in a ninth century hellhole. He deserves our respect, admiration, and support. Everyone in this town should be involved in this issue. Teddy Roosevelt would have sent in the Calvary and Winston Churchill the RAF. What did G.I. Joe in the trenches die for? Certainly not for us to forfeit the freedom of American citizens to a despotic regime like Saudi Arabia. In their response to the written questions, the State Department repeats that their highest prior priority is protection of American citizens. Counselor of officers met with my daughters in London at the request of Adil Jaber, not Ali and Aisha, and against my wishes, knowing full well that the girls never had a chance to speak freely. The State Department was so eager to make this happen and put a knife in my back and then turn it to appease their Saudi clients, stop me and prevent my innocent daughters from even having a chance at freedom. They knew the girls would be taken back to their Saudi prison. If the Saudis and their American pimps were sadistic and cold-blooded, what about our own State Department? The State Department feels they are justified, case closed. In their written response to questions posed by the committee, they state that in the London meeting, Ali and Aisha were told that they were American citizens and could claim their U.S. passports at the American Embassy in Riyadh. What a joke. Prince Saud states that any American citizen woman can leave if she wants to, but no one has left. And U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Robert Jordan, states that he will not expel any U.S. citizen from the embassy in Saudi Arabia like Monica Stowers and her children were escorted out by the Marines. But Jordan failed to state what he would do with these American women once they got to the embassy. He didn't offer to assist the, to offer them passports, get them into an embassy car, and then take them to a U.S. military base and pack them safely on a military plane heading for U.S. soil. No, Mr. Jordan didn't make that promise. It would offend the Saudis and our special relationship with them would be in jeopardy. Funny thing, last week, Prince Bandar's wife, Princess Haifa El Faisal, was caught funneling money to the same terrorists that killed almost 3,000 Americans on their way to work one September morning. The New York Times explained that the princess was sitting in her pool house, surrounded by her eight children, and received telephone calls, offering her support from Barbara Bush and Alma Powell. In 17 years, no one has called me to say how sorry they are for what this government and the Saudi government have done to my family. But the Saudi ambassador and his wife are consoled by our highest leaders and their families before the facts are known about their involvement on an attack on our country. But of course, the Saudis are our friends, and this friendship is based on money, and that is all that counts. Let's work backwards from that premise. Meanwhile, Petrozillo stated in the October hearing that he has no opinion about whether or not the Saudi government is holding Americans against their will in Saudi Arabia. He only writes the scripts, disseminates the propaganda on Capitol Hill, organizes dirty games against two defenseless innocent women who have suffered nearly all their lives at the hands of the Saudis 
and then collects his $200,000 per month from his Saudi masters. In other words, he'll do anything for money. The Saudi embassy has instructed all the lobbyists and public relations specialists not to turn over the subpoena documents. If they have nothing to hide and are so interested in insisting the committee in resolving these cases as their attorney, Maureen Mahoney from the Washington law firm of Lathan and Watkins states, why not just allow the committee to review the documents? In her letter of November 14th to Chief Counsel James Wilson, Ms. Mahoney states that, the Saudi, that Saudi Arabia has given very serious conditions consideration to the issues raised by the committee surrounding the kidnapping of American citizens. She carefully outlines the steps that the Saudi government has initiated to protect the children and reach an intergovernmental solution. I can tell you that as a 17-year veteran of the Saudi government and their retainer schemes and dirty tricks, Ms. Mahoney's statements are nothing but a perpetuation of non-meaningful jargonese expressed by another paid mouthpiece for the Saudis. What she is saying means nothing in reality to my daughter's granddaughter, Monica Stower's daughter, or the hundreds of other American women and children in Saudi Arabia whose voices cannot be heard and whom I represent in absentia. The creation of a task force ongoing dialogue with the State Department, etc., means nothing. Prince Bandar's letter to Dan Burton dated October 22nd states, the embassy retained these firms to assist with its performance of core diplomatic functions. Does Prince Bender call what happened in London over Labor Day weekend part of the embassy's diplomatic functions? Sending my daughters to London was a public relations stunt to harm the efforts of the chairman and the committee to have my daughters released. It was also a cynical, brutal manipulation of two young women who are victims of contemporary slavery. This is all part of the continual dissemination of factual misrepresentations to members of Congress and the media by the Saudi officials and their PR people. These documents are of the utmost importance to reveal the true facts behind what the lobbyists and PR specialists have been doing to American citizens. This has nothing to do with diplomatic relations, and the Saudi government is once again attempting to hide behind some law or convention to protect itself from being revealed as participating in possible criminal acts and against all humanity, which are certainly against all of God's laws. For the Saudi Arabian government to hide behind the Vienna Convention for Diplomatic Relations is a scandal and a mockery of that document. These torture lobbyist public relations specialist law firms are working as foreign agents inside the United States and are not diplomats. I further charge that diplomats such as Adil Jaber, Niall Jaber, Prince Bandar, and others like him be expelled from the United States persona non gratis for their participation in criminal acts against American citizens. We cannot deport Petrozello and the other U.S. citizens who have sold themselves to the Saudis, but we can and must hold them accountable for their dastardly deeds. And may God have mercy on their souls. Thank you very much, Ms. Roush. Uh, I think you covered it all very well. Uh, Ms. McLean will recognize you now. Uh, we, we want you to tell your whole story as you want to, but we'd like to hold it down to 15 minutes if we could. I know that you yes. have a lot you want to say, and, and, with, and as did Ms. Roush. I mean, I can understand the emotion behind this because you've been fighting these battles for so long. So uh, we'll be as lenient as we possibly can, and, and Professor Denzel will get to you in just a little bit. Congressman Burton and members of the committee, thank you for asking me to appear here again. I have personally had a long and unpleasant acquaintance with the Saudi public relations machine in Washington. Shortly after the Saudi embassy aided in the kidnapping of my daughter, Heidi Alamari, in 1997, I contacted... Excuse, excuse me just one moment. Uh, I see the four Saudi lawyers back there. Do you guys find something humorous in what's going on here? Uh, I've noticed you were laughing. I thought maybe you found something. Don't find it. Thank you. Okay, Ms. McLean. I have personally had a long and unpleasant acquaintance with the Saudi public relations machine in Washington. Shortly after the Saudi embassy aided in the kidnapping of my daughter, Heidi Alomari, in 1997, I contacted then Secretary of Transportation, Rodney Slater. I took issue with the Department of Transportation's failure to investigate Saudi Arabian Airlines' complicity in the disappearance of my child. 
I recommended that Saudi Airlines U.S. landing rights be suspended for knowingly allowing its employees, one of whom is Heidi's uncle, to violate our laws. Foolishly, I believe that Slater, a fellow Arkansan and former colleague at Arkansas State University, would take an interest in a missing Arkansas child. Little did I know of the very cozy relationship between Slater and the Saudis. I did know, of course, that Slater's alma mater, the University of Arkansas, had been on the receiving end of Prince Bondar's largesse in the form of a $23.5 million gift to establish a Middle Eastern Studies Center. Little did I suspect, however, that the same public official who so cavalierly turned his back on my daughter would go on to a lucrative position at Patton Boggs, the same outfit that supposedly sits here today, scoffing at Congress and protecting the secret communiques of the Saudi terrorists at Bandar's embassy. Patton Boggs' own literature lauds Slater's accomplishments in the areas of national security and his pivotal roles in liberalizing the global aviation marketplace. Need I point out that Slater's concern for national security and liberalization of global aviation allowed our children to be stolen and subsequently allowed 15 Saudi terrorists to enter our country. In 1999, we victims of Saudi kidnapping plots were attacked further by Bandar's PR gurus. Uh, Hill and Nelton, as uh, Ms. Roush has already mentioned, intercepted our private emails and threatened us. Apparently, H&K was upset about two things. One, our upcoming press conference at the National Press Club on the topic of Saudi human rights abuses. And two, our Texaco Aramco boycott. Texaco is in partnership with Aramco on numerous projects. Since Aramco is owned by the Saudi royal family, it is they who give aid, comfort, and lucrative jobs to international kidnappers like my ex-husband. It is not difficult to guess why the Saudis want secret communiques and documents regarding the abductions of our children to be kept out of the public eye. Such revelations would result in further humiliation for the embassy, even more embarrassing than Mr. Al Jubair's exposure on 60 Minutes. The release of documents relating to my daughter's case, now in the hands of lobbying firms, could reveal the existence of the following information. Correspondence between the embassy and the kidnapper regarding this matter. Correspondence from me informing the embassy of Heidi's legal status. Records indicating that the kidnapper was on the embassy payroll at the time of my child's kidnapping. Records pointing to the involvement of a high Saudi National Guard official in the harboring of the criminal in the Washington area. Financial records relating to the ticketing of the fugitive and my daughter aboard a Saudi Airlines flight. The names of other Saudi government officials involved in the kidnapping of my child. Falsified birth certificate for my daughter. Memos relating to the embassy's knowledge of Alamary's and my daughter's whereabouts in 1997, in spite of two years of Saudi denials to the U.S. Embassy in Riyadh, and other documents indicating whether the embassy's lobbyists are aware of the Saudi embassy's complicity in Heidi's kidnapping. Just as the money trail has led directly back to the lap of Prince Bondar's family in the 9-11 terrorist attacks, so too will it in the kidnappings of American citizens. If the Saudi embassy has nothing to hide, why have Bandar and his PR machine gone into overdrive to protect known criminals like my ex-husband, a mere lowly computer programmer? The relationship between the embassy and the 9-11 terrorists, the complicity of the Saudi embassy and the stealing of American children, these are just two examples of the concept of diplomatic immunity gone awry. Now, Ameri American lobbying firms are trying to give a whole new meaning to the term diplomatic immunity as they aid and abet a massive cover-up of Saudi crimes against American children. While the Saudi embassy continues to break U.S. laws, it scatters its blood money all over Washington. The Saudi PR web of deceit manages to buy or beg airtime in the U.S. media to promulgate the Saudi version of history. 
that the Saudis are our allies, that Wahhabism is a peaceful religion, that Granny Haifa would never, ever send money to terrorists, despite the fact that her family financed a telethon to raise cold, hard cash for suicide bombers, and that there are no American children taken to Saudi Arabia against their will. What other lies about the Saudi government are hidden in the secret vaults of Corvus, Patton Boggs, and the Gallagher Group? It is indeed a telling circumstance that even Patton Boggs insiders are aghast at some of the dirty work they've been forced to do. One whistleblower called for Patton Boggs to end its relationship with Corvus. He told Forward Magazine in May 2002 that the Saudi finance PR campaign was scurrilous. Patton Boggs' managing partner, Stuart Pape, reported that several partners had lobbied to drop Saudi Arabia as a client. In the November 22 issue of the New York Sun, Mr. Pape revealed that the firm had been, quote, instructed by the Saudi embassy to work with Mr. Burton's committee to find a solution to the Saudi kidnapping problem. Is this what Patton Boggs calls working with the committee? Deceit, lies, and the refusal to turn over subpoenaed documents, and now the escape of the people I'm talking about. Well, my daughter and I still don't have a solution, so what are these lobbyists waiting for? After hearing Al Jaber dismiss all but four cases of international child abduction yesterday, it is obvious that the Saudis' idea of a solution is the same as it's always been. Delay, delay, stall, stall, and then delay some more until our girls are old enough to be sold off to the highest bidder. That's what the solution was for Pat's and Monica's daughters, and that's what will happen to Heidi. Last month, I and other grieving parents had to sit here and bite our tongues as we were subjected to a sickening display of stonewalling and double talk by Bandar's mouthpiece, Michael Petrozello of Corvus. We came here to tell the truth. Unlike Mr. Petruzzello, we did not have an entourage of lawyers whispering in our ears at every turn, telling us how to make our lives sound good. There isn't enough cash in the entire kingdom of Saudi Arabia to make the Saudi royals or their Washington henchmen look any better than they do right now. In conclusion, I'd like to remind the Saudis that they have no need to fork over tons of cash to the likes of Corvus, Patton Boggs, Gallagher, Hill, and Knowlton, and others of their ilk. Let me close by giving the best public relations advice the Saudi embassy will ever receive, and my expertise won't cost them one red cent. I give the Saudi royals the same counsel given to the Egyptian pharaoh over 5,000 years ago, and I quote from the book of Exodus in the words of the Jewish prophet Moses, let my people go. Thank you very much, Ms. McLean. You're welcome. That's a very cogent statement. Uh, Professor Denza, do you have a statement? Is your, can you, you might pull your mic a little bit closer because sometimes it's hard to pick up. Uh, and is your, is your mic on? I, I think, I think okay. it's, I think it's on now. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to begin before coming on to the exact definition of the term archives and documents under the Vienna Convention with a very important provision which governs all the privileges and immunities set out in the Vienna Convention on diplomatic relations, and that's uh, Article 41, first paragraph, and it begins, without prejudice to their privileges and immunities, it is the duty of all persons enjoying such privileges and immunities to respect the laws and regulations of the receiving state. They also have a duty not to intervene, uh, interfere in the inter internal affairs of that state. It's very clearly accepted now as a proposition of modern international law uh, that there's no question uh, short of specific exemptions or exceptions for embassies or their diplomats not to be legally bound. And the Foreign Agents Registration Act, which uh, has been in existence for about 60 years, there's a very clear application to the um, operations of foreign states in the United States. The policy of the Act, as it, it seems to 
a, a lawyer from outside, uh, is that it, it is quite acceptable uh, for uh, the um, propaganda activities, if I can use that expression, to be carried on, but they must be carried on within a framework of transparency. There are no specific exemptions in the Foreign Agents Registration Act. The, the three firms we're dealing with are all registered under the Act, uh, and I don't uh, believe that there ever has been any complaint by any foreign state that somehow uh, this um, <coughs> Act uh, was um, incompatible with their uh, ordinary operations and of course it, it, I accept it's, a, it, it's an essential diplomatic function of the ambassador and his staff to be putting the position of um, in this case uh, uh, Saudi Arabia it used to be said that the ambassador was the eyes the ears uh, and the mouth of the the sending state but no one's ever seen any problem with the um, the, the Act. The, the Act, of course, uh, has to operate within uh, the uh, exact terms of the specific privileges and immunities. But for part of my reason, before I come to that, for setting out 41 and the, the background is that I, I see no reason for construing the term archives and documents in, in uh, this case, which it's an unusual, it's an unprecedented claim. I see no reason for pushing the definition of archives and documents out. I'll turn now uh, to uh, the definition um, and the terms of Article 24 of the Vienna Convention, uh, which says very shortly that the archives and documents of the mission shall be inviolable at any time and wherever they may be. Now, the inviolability of, of archives is in the history of diplomatic law is a relatively uh, recent development. I think it's fair to say that up till uh, the early years and perhaps about the time that the Foreign Agents uh, Registration Act was being passed, it was generally regarded as only applying to archives on the premises of the mission, and that's perhaps what one thinks of as, as archives, ancient documents on, uh, um, on parchment, uh, old treaties, records of um, Ed Memoir, which are held physically securely in the embassy. Uh, the question of the status of archives outside mission premises it came very sharply into focus in 1946 in a leading case in, in, in Canada where the Canadian Court of Appeals had to decide on whether embassy archives from the embassy of the Soviet Union were admissible. What had happened was that um, uh, a, a, a Soviet cipher clerk had defected, and when he defected, he had taken with him uh, incriminating documents which showed uh, the existence in Canada in the early years of the Cold War of a whole network of spies. Uh, and uh, the, uh, that extended not, not only to Soviet uh, citizens, it extended very importantly to a Canadian member of Parliament, and that was the Rose, who uh, uh, was tried and um, appealed from conviction, arguing that uh, there was no other evidence against him except the stolen uh, embassy documents. He couldn't be convicted. Um, now, it, there were a variety of reasons given by the court for rejecting admissibility and uh, allowing the conviction to stand on the basis of uh, the, uh, the archives. Uh, it, it, one of them I, I noticed it, with, with some interest was the, uh, uh, that one of the judges actually said that the relevant documents uh, which were uh, documents of an espionage bureau within the Soviet embassy, not directly within the control of the ambassador, were not embassy documents. I think that, that there may be some importance in that uh, reference to, to control. 
Now, going to 1961, the, Ro the Rose case was very much in the minds of the, uh, uh, the negotiators. It, certain propositions were clearly established uh, that um, archives uh, and documents of the mission were inviolable at any time. That was really referring to the possibility of breach of diplomatic relations and wherever they may be. And I think primarily uh, what was in the minds of the negotiators uh, was not that uh, somehow archives and documents could uh, cover the whole of the in and out correspondence of the mission. Uh, it was looking at the possibility that the archives were in the custody of a member of the mission physically going to a meeting at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, going to the airport without being an accredited courier. Uh, possibly even without being having uh, mission status, or that they'd actually physically been lost or stolen. And that accident shouldn't deprive them of uh, their character. The Convention also made clear that the, 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 the documents don't, um, uh, don't require to be identified by visible official marks. And of course in that the position is different from uh, that of um, uh, diplomatic bags. Now, there have not been very many cases uh, about, uh, uh, about archives on, on, on the whole. Uh, the, the most sensitive things tend to be rather carefully um, safeguarded. Uh, but the um, case which I've referred to uh, in, um, in the, the, the um, opinion which uh, I've, I've given to the committee is, is very relevant. It, it describes the, the, the test for archives is that the documents must belong to or be in the possession of the mission. Uh, and I, I think that that case uh, which depended on legislation which carried over the specific terms of the Vienna Convention, while of course it clearly would not be binding on a United States court, would be very persuasive. It was a decision at the highest level, the House of Lords, and it was unanimous. And as I understand it, this, this test of belonging to or in the possession of is, I think, seems to be generally accepted in the informal discussions there uh, have been. Now, the, there was a, a slight lacuna in the Tin Council, uh, International Tin Council judgment in that the International Tin Council um, to narrow the issues said they were not concerned with documents in the possession of an agent or bailey of the council. Uh, the, the reason for that concession, as I recollect it, because I actually um, was one of those appearing in, in the case, uh, was that there seemed no um, reason to suppose that the documents which had found their way into the public domain had actually uh, done so by being given to agents or baileys. Uh, so the House of Lords don't specifically deal uh, with agency. Uh, I think this, I've been thinking about the, what the test is on the question of documents where there may be some degree of um, uh, an agency relationship. Uh, one possibility is that at that point one looks to local law to interpret. Um, there's, there's, of course, it's not my area of expertise, but the, the common law is fairly uniform. Um, I, I don't think there are huge differences. I don't believe that um, uh, under English uh, law that the documents of um, consultants uh, or advisors uh, to an embassy would be uh, regarded as the property of the embassy, the basic uh, sorting principle of the common law, as I understand it, that when a letter is sent, um, uh, the, the, the physical property in the document passes to the uh, re recipient. Uh, there can, could, of course, be special terms, but as I understand it, there have no, been no special terms here. And, of course, uh, there may be other issues, of copyright, for example, which I think, again, are not, uh, are not uh, material. The, the test of local law to determine ownership uh, is perhaps not entirely satisfactory because it could lead to possibly to a lack of um, a lack of uniformity not only among the 180 
uh, states who are parties to the convention, but also, as I understand, within the different jurisdictions in the, um, in the, in the United States, it would be rather difficult to de determine uh, the, the question differently in the law of Virginia and the law of the District of uh, uh, Columbia. It, it may be, therefore, that the, 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 the right test is to look uh, for at, at whether there are any circumstances in which documents originating uh, in an embassy uh, but sent outside could, uh, could remain protected. And thinking objectively uh, uh, about it, it, it seemed to me that that really ought only to be the case where one is perhaps talking about an agent who is purely a mouthpiece for the um, embassy uh, and I <clears throat> had in mind the uh, possible possibility of an interpreter or translator uh, sent um, a, a, a document in the, the foreign language, the language of the sending state, in order to, to translate it uh, with no substantive input into the content. Um, and I think it's arguable that in that case the document would continue to be an archive. That seems to me very different from the position of um, public relations uh, um, specialists whose function is, is very much to ad advise. Uh, and then that takes me back to the policy of the Act that advice on how to present the case for your government is, is, is quite proper, it's perfectly proper for the ambassador to uh, employ local expertise, but he must respect and, um, and obey, obey the, the, the local law which provides uh, the, 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 the framework. So coming, coming back, it, it does in fact remain uh, my, my own conclusion, although, uh, of, of course, ultimately, the, the, the question might, require, uh, might well require to be tested uh, in, in, in a court uh, of law, but, but the, that in the present circumstances, uh, the, um, the, the, these documents, which cover, of course, opinions generated outside, uh, outside the embassy, and I, I found it very interesting to listen to the kinds of document listed by the, uh, by the previous witness as to what we're uh, talking about, many of these not in any sense being embassy memoranda uh, or secret communications between the Saudi ambassador and his government, but quite different kinds of information perfectly properly held within the, the scope of the Act and as it seems to me perfectly clearly accessible. Uh, I, I'd just like to um, it also deal uh, with the question of the correspondence of the, the mission, because that takes us over to a different article of the Convention, Article 27, which deals with freedom of communication, and that has been um, argued uh, in um, uh, the exchanges that there, there have been about the status of the, the, the documents. Article 27.2 says that the official correspondence of the mission uh, shall be in, inviolable. Now, it, it's clear from, to some extent, from the, the, the records of the convention that what was meant by uh, correspondence was really um, material in transit. Uh, the, the, there's no indication from the records of the conference that they were meaning that any letter that came from an embassy to anyone in the receiving state was in, inviolable. It was a question of the agents of the receiving state not intercepting this. And of course, historically, there are a great many cases of interception of uh, an embassy's um, uh, communications. Uh, and again, perhaps it, it, I think it probably is the case that letters actually in transit that they can't be intercepted in, in the post. Uh, there's... Um, I think it's also helpful in looking at the extent of the protection given by Article 27 to look back at the beginning of Article 27, which is, in my view, the most important article uh, in, in, the, in the Vienna Convention. And what the Article 27 at the beginning says, the receiving state shall permit and protect 
free communication on the part of the mission for all official purposes. Now, the critical point, I think, is the next sentence, which is, in communicating with the government and the other missions and consulates of the sending state, wherever situated, the mission may employ all appropriate means, including diplomatic couriers and messages in code or cipher. And there's also reference to the diplomatic uh, uh, wireless. So one sees from the beginning of 27, which I think should be carried over to paragraph 2 of Article 27, that this is not really dealing with the correspondence between the mission and the outside world. It's really dealing with internal correspondence. It, it means that a state which can't afford to send a courier in a bag can put a letter in the post addressed to the government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and that letter, uh, if it accidentally is lost or if it's intercepted or stolen, is not admissible in evidence. And, and again, I think the, the test on 27.2 um, is, is, is legally the same as that that applies in the case of archives and documents. There is very little case law on 27.2 uh, for the simple reason uh, that this is the practice of government uh, not to send delicate, sensitive, controversial letters through the open post. They send them by hand of a diplomatic agent or they send them by hand of uh, the courier. But I don't think that 27.2 gives uh, a, a wider uh, uh, protection to any of the documents uh, that we are um, that we are concerned with. Um, so, simply to sum up in in, in, in one uh, sentence, uh, it, it is not my view that the the documents in the um, which are clearly in the possession of the firms which have been uh, subpoenaed. Um, are entitled to inviolability. And I, it is also my view, having in the light of the correspondence I've seen, that the implications of accepting the proposition put forward uh, that these archives are uh, inviolable would be very far-reaching and very dangerous. And I realize that the committee are very well aware of this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Professor. Um, Professor, do you have any concern that the legal theory being put forward by the Saudis could be used to cloak the documents of spies, terrorists, and other individuals who receive funds and directions from embassies? So far as documents, yes. I, I, I think that was what I was uh, alluding to in, in, in my concluding. Um, concluding words. I think there's no distinction of, of principle. Well, let, uh, let, let, let me just say, interrupt, yes. because I want to make sure that in layman's language everyone yes. understands. As uh -huh. I understand your, your statements and, and all of the research that you've done, mm. if it's between the embassy and other internal governmental agencies, yes. that is held inviolate. Indeed. Yes. But if it is uh, 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 correspondence or uh, some kind of transmissions between a embassy, government, uh, or government entity to a public relations firm that is in the control of the public relations firm, mm. then that is not inviolate. I, I believe that that is the correct position. Yes, it is not, these documents are not inviolable. Now let me ask you about your credentials because I think this is very, very important. Uh, you, you advise, as I understand it, uh, you, you, uh, you uh, advise the British government and the U.S. State Department uh, regarding the Vienna Convention, is that correct? Um, I was a legal advisor within the British Foreign Office for uh, a number of uh, years. I think my main credentials really are that I've written um, what I think is the standard book on the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, uh, and I did work on these issues uh, when I was working uh, within within government. So, so you, you're considered probably, and I don't, 
I know you're probably very modest, but you're probably one of the foremost experts on the Vienna Convention. I've, I've always been very, very interested in it. I, uh, when I joined the Foreign Office as an Assistant Legal Advisor, the first thing I was asked to do was to, um, uh, which was after the uh, conclusion of the Vienna uh, Convention, was to, uh, to write an article. And the article grew over a period of about 10 years into a book. And, uh, uh, and there's been a more uh, second edition, which of course I've written outside government and therefore which uh, without uh, using any privileged information. Mm -hmm. Excuse me for one second. In the uh, letters of the lawyers for the Saudi embassy, which you have received, they claim that a court could conduct an in-camera review of documents in a case of espionage and find that law enforcement's need for the documents outweighs the embassy's interest in keeping them secret. Do you think there is any support for such a theory, or are the Saudis just making that theory up to draw attention away from the disastrous consequences of the privileged claim? It, it is my view that this idea uh, will not work in the context of inviolable documents. Uh, I accept that the position may be different if you're dealing with a privilege conferred by, by local law, for, for example, the privilege of the executive or the privilege of the lawyer, it's then perhaps possible for a national court, a domestic court, to carry out a balancing act. Uh, when you're dealing with inviolable documents, of, uh, which, if they are inviolable, essentially belong to a foreign government, I, I don't think this is, is practical or, or possible. Either the documents are inviolable uh, or they're not inviolable. Of course, it, some of the documents may also be covered by claims to privilege, which are not my concern, such as legal professional uh, uh, privilege. Where they, there may be more than one uh, ground advanced to protect the documents. And, of course, I'm not saying anything about what's the position if it was argued they were covered by legal professional privilege. But I, I don't think there's any support in any of the cases for the idea... Uh, that um, an inviolability, the court of the receiving state, in this case the United States, can, can properly balance the interest of the foreign state against the interest of its own uh, judicial system. Such balancing as is done has to be done by the actual terms of the, uh, of the convention. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a little bit more tape I'd like to run, and then we'll get back to our questions and wrap this up. country would prevent American children from leaving of their own free will? Libya? North Korea? Tomorrow, a congressional hearing begins, and it will hear testimony that Americans are being held against their will, not in an enemy country, but within the borders of an ally, Saudi Arabia. Today on Capitol Hill, there was angry and sometimes emotional criticism of U.S. cooperation with the Saudis. CBS's Thalia Ashuras reports it came from American women whose daughters are trapped in Saudi Arabia. A congressional committee there heard some very emotional testimony from American women whose daughters and granddaughters are being held against their will in Saudi Arabia. These are American children kidnapped by Saudi family members and who lead a life of constant fear and abuse. ABC's John Yang reports. I came here today to plead for my daughter and my granddaughter's life. It's like a horror picture. Saudi Arabia is a totalitarian state where my daughters are locked up, wrapped up, and shut up. Heart-wrenching testimony from women desperate to see their children and grandchildren held against their will in a country where women and children cannot leave without the permission of their husband, father, or brother. It would seem unthinkable that dozens of American citizens could be held against their will in a country with which we've long had cordial relations. 
But that is just what is happening to American girls who've been kidnapped from their American mothers by their Saudi fathers. Most of them never see the United States or their mothers again. Why? Because Saudi Arabia is the only country in the world where a female cannot leave without written permission from her closest male relative. And in most abduction cases, that is her father, the man who kidnapped her in the first place. Case in point, 16-year-old Maha. You just want to see your mother and be with her. And living in the States, I lived in the States for about five years. And um, those were the best years of my life. Do you think that uh, other young people, especially women being held in Saudi Arabia, are free to speak their minds? No, they're not. Especially if they want to come back to the U.S., they're not able to say that? They're threatened. They're they threatened? Yes. Drea was an American citizen and had every right to be protected under our Constitution. They failed us. Desperate secret phone calls to her mother led to desperate escape attempts. I can't stay here anymore. Stay here. Two years later, in a plot partly paid for by the sale of her grandmother's house, Drea was back in Florida. No thanks to the U.S. government they had pleaded with for help. Exhibit 12 is a cable from Riyadh to Washington describing a visit to an embassy official had with you and your father while you were being held in Saudi Arabia. The State Department staffer says that you wanted to stay in Riyadh and that your father was clearly fond of you. Uh, do you think that they didn't understand uh, and what did you have to say in front of your father to them did you tell them that you wanted to stay in Saudi Arabia no I those words never came out of what my did mouth. you say the most they would offer me is to talk to my father but they didn't understand that if they talked to my father my father would kill me you, you couldn't tell them that while you I were couldn't there. say anything all the visits that happened were with well, did, him. Did, did they understand the culture over there and the, and the possibilities of harm to, to I guess not my name is Joanna Stevenson Tanetti. I'm from Terre Haute, Indiana. I am the mother of three children who were abducted by their non-custodial father to Saudi Arabia two years ago. Now my arms are empty. No little boy counts my kisses or my love. No more Girl Scout meetings. No more tennis matches or softball games. Only memories of three lives lost behind a Saudi sword. Are your children, Ms. Tanetti, being held against their will? Yes, my American children are being held against their will. My daughter is a hostage in Saudi Arabia. Mr. Rives, uh, my children are three or four. They don't know what their will is yet. Okay. My daughter is being held in Saudi Arabia against her will. Mr. Petrosello, do you believe that uh, their children are being held against their will? Um, Congressman, I'm, I'm not a representative or a spokesperson for the government. I, I, I didn't ask you any other question than the question I just asked okay. you. But, Congressman, I don't know anything about Ms. Tinetti's children. So what is your answer? I, that, I do, that I do not know. Do you think that she's lying? I have no reason to believe that she's lying. We are being accused of, some, of a crime that we did not commit. We are trying to solve these cases. Why would we want to have these cases linger? But the fact is, Monica Stowers has been trying to get an exit visa for her daughter Amjad, who was born in Houston, Texas, since she was a child. And she is now 19 years old. We were accused of not allowing her to leave. I'm telling you she has a passport and she has a visa. Why doesn't she leave? When did she get it? When she asked for it. No, 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 please. She had, Mike, and as soon as we found out about it, we fixed it. So which means we move very quickly. I told you I didn't know about this case until, what, a month ago. That is simply not true. Back in 1988, Algebra wrote a letter and signed it, saying there was nothing the Saudi government could do about Amjad's case. The Saudi government says that it acts quickly to solve these cases once it learns about them. Is that true? No, it's not. So you would just let your child go then? Of course not. What would you do? Well, I would anything I could to get my child back. Would you sell your house and get $200,000 and go over and have somebody steal the child in the middle of the night to get him back when they're U.S. citizens? Would you do that? Congressman, I would do anything for my son. There. Uh, you would do anything for your son. What do you think about these people around you? Ms. Tanetti, did you talk to your child yesterday? Did you talk to your children? For a little bit, yes. How'd they sound? Beautiful. Beautiful. Did they recognize you and everything? 
Yes. First time you talked to him since we were over in Saudi Arabia, right? Yes. Yeah. And you hadn't talked to him before that for two years except for Congressman Kern down there at the end arranging it for you, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. I know you're getting $200,000 a month, and I understand your business. I do, because lobbyists come to see us all the time. And I don't know if you have any influence over those guys over there. But these women haven't, she hasn't seen her children for two years and the court gave her custody. This lady next to her, Ms. McLean, hasn't seen her child. How long, Ms. McLean? I saw it this summer. How long has it been since, since she's been gone? Five years. Five years. How long has your son been gone? A year and a half. A year and a half. 17 years. This is the government that you're representing. This is an issue that animates this entire Congress. Uh, it strikes us at the core of what we all put first, our own families. We won't accept this treatment from any ally. We won't accept it from any enemy. And you, as speaking for myself, we reg I regard uh, a country that would treat these parents as these mothers have been treated not as an ally at all, not as a friend at all, but I put them in uh, the, the, the category with other opponents of all we believe. Uh, you've got to understand that for us, this issue uh, knows no party. Copies of the final divorce decree were mailed to the Saudi Embassy and all other Saudi offices within the United States. It is also apparent that the Saudis disregarded the decree, decree and the court order and issued new pas passports to my ex-husband, making them knowing and willing accomplices in the abduction of three American citizens. Not only do the Saudis hide, harbor, and shelter criminals, they also aid and abet them. Mr. Crocker, would you agree that in the Tonetti case that the Saudi Embassy appears to have issued passport to Joannis Tonetti's uh, children despite the fact that it had been warned that her ex-husband did not have custody of the children and was not allowed to take them out of the country? Uh, well, I certainly heard her testimony in which she laid all that out. Well, would you agree that in the McCain, McLean case that the Saudi government apparently issued a passport to Heidi uh, despite the fact that it had been warned that uh, the father did not have custody of Heidi and was not allowed to take her out of the country? Uh, there again, I, I heard the testimony. Mm -hmm. Does the State Department uh, consider the Saudi government to have been complicit in the Tenetti and the McLean kidnappings? Um, I can't take a position on that, Mr. Chairman. As I said, I've, I've heard the testimony. Um, you're, you're with the State Department, aren't you? That is correct. But he did, your judge did make it clear that they were not to be taken out of the country. Correct. And he, he, did he write or call the embassy? He wrote, I believe, and you should have a copy of the divorce decree. Okay, with... so he, he wrote to the embassy and there was mm -hmm. a copy of the divorce decree yes, that was sent and... to the Saudi embassy saying, mm -hmm. don't take these kids out of the country. Exactly, not to issue passports. And okay. It was mailed regular and certified, so there are signed copies. So it was certified? Yes, you should have copies of all the certifications. And, and, and so the Saudis knew about this? Oh, yes. And uh, they were complicit. They were parties to the kidnapping of your children? Yes, they were. They knew it? Yes, they did. So they broke the law? Well, they don't recognize our law. No, no, I bet they broke our law. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll make them more aware of our law. Did you or your firm help draft Prince Bandar's letter to the Wall Street Journal and the letter that said, quote, some have charged that Saudi Arabia is holding Americans against their will and this is absolutely not true? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe we provided some early drafts and talking points for that letter. So you did help draft that letter? Yes, sir. Do you really believe that statement? Um, Mr. Chairman, it is the position and statement of uh, the government of Saudi Arabia. But you helped draft it. Yes, sir. And, and, and if you drafted it, it says some have charged that Saudi Arabia is holding Americans against their will. This is absolutely not true. Since you helped draft it, don't you, don't you think that you ought to know whether or not that's true? You think they're not holding Americans against their will over there? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, that is the position that Saudi Arabia has, has publicly stated. I really don't have anything more to add to that. Do you believe that uh, they're not holding people against their will over there? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, these are very complex legal and, and matters and matters of international law, which I really don't have a full grasp of, so I really can't comment any further on that. You saw the testimony of some of these young ladies over here who have escaped from Saudi Arabia. Do you think they lied? I don't have any re reason to believe they lied, no, sir. And, and you get $200,000 a month from the Saudi government? That's correct. Mm. We have begged the State Department, our senators, and our Congress for help. We got nothing but silence. There was nothing they could do. Why is it that the Saudis can ask for the U.S. Army to protect them, but they can't protect our children? They can't help our children. Can anyone tell me why they can't do something for our children? Please, help our children. And it's not lost on the Saudi government how important this is, uh, both to, to the families um, and, and, and to U Saudi U.S. relations. All right, thank you for that. Thank Did you gentlemen yield to me? Yes, yes. Sir. If it's not lost on the Saudi government, and I know you're their PR guy and you got to make them look good. But I got to tell you, I looked them right in the eye when I was over there. It's lost on them. It's lost on them. They don't know what, they don't care. They, they'll give you lip service and they'll pay you 200,000 bucks a month to make them look good. But they don't care. They don't care about these women and their kids. They don't care. The men rule. The men rule. If you're a woman and your husband says, you don't go to the bathroom, you, go, you don't go to the bathroom. If the, if the husband says, you don't go out the front door, you don't go out the front door. They say to the kids, you do this, if you don't, they tie you up and beat the hell out of you like this woman was talking, this, that we were hearing, hearing about earlier. I mean, come on. To, to make it look like they have a... a, 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 a humane face regarding the people whose kids have been kidnapped and taken away from them is just a downgone lie. It's just a lie. They don't care. And if they do care, they do something about it. Rosemary Sarah and Z are beautiful American children. My oldest daughter Rose was a terrific student and loved by everybody in her class. Excuse me if I cry. She loves to play tennis and softball and to swim. She was a Girl Scout, and she's my best friend. I still receive phone calls from her friends wanting to know when she's coming home. Rose met Miss America during her third grade year, and it became her dream to someday become Miss America herself. Now that dream is locked behind veils and a bias. Sarah played softball and was my bookworm. She was bright and funny and incredibly intelligent. She was also a Girl Scout and was very much loved by her classmates and teachers. She's the master of all things computer-related and managed to make me feel about 20 years older than I really was. My baby is my son, Z, and he's my little boy who loved to play football but could never figure out which direction to run. Parents would cringe when he took the field. He loved to fish and to swim and to play and uh, anything that involved hitting another player. Every night he would cuddle up in my arms and ask me how many times I loved him. I knew this was a delay tactic to avoid going to bed, but uh, I bought into it every time. Ladies and gentlemen, it's hard not to give up. I've turned from help from every source I can think of. There's not one politician that I have not written and begged for help and in return received silence. Up until a few months ago, nobody cared about my three American children, and I suppose when this is all over and the dust settles, things will go back to the way they were. You will all go home to your families and your lives. New causes will come along and thoughts of American children trapped in Saudi Arabia will fade. So who will move a mountain for three children? Who will salvage their childhood where there's still time left? Who will bring them back to the only home they ever knew or wanted? I think uh, that pretty much says it all. I uh, asked questions of the State Department when they were here. One of the questions was, has the State Department expressed any concern to the Saudi government regarding its role in the kidnapping of Heidi Alamari? 
And the answer they wrote back to me in writing was, the department has no evidence that the Saudi government played a role in the kidnapping of Heidi. And that is just so disgusting because it's so evident that the Saudi government knew about it, they were informed about it, and they went ahead and granted the passports anyhow. And I'm disappointed in our State Department for making that kind of a statement because it's so evident that they were complicitous. Professor Denzel, let me just ask you one more question. Is there any reason to think that the definition of inviolability, inviolability under the Vienna Convention would differ depending on whether the Justice Department or Congress was asking for the documents? No, inviolability implies that neither the executive or the legislative or the judicial authorities in the receiving state uh, can use any legal powers of compulsion to require documents to be supplied or in the case of personal immunity a person to uh, to appear that that uh, was very clearly helpfully set out in the judgment in the international tin council case to which i so, referred so if 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 a public relations firm had correspondence and other information in their control. In your opinion, whether it was the Justice Department, the administration, or the Congress, the legislative branch uh, subpoenaed those, uh, they would be able to get them. That, that's right. If they're not inviolable, then the ordinary processes of United States law apply. Mm. Okay. Uh, let me just ask... Uh, Ms. Roush and Ms. McLean, just a couple of questions here, and then we'll, uh, I'll make a final statement, and then we'll wrap this up. Ms. Roush, uh, you have a lot of experience dealing with Saudi lobbyists. Have they been honest with you in the past? No, sir. They have manipulated me, and they've lied to me and betrayed me and used me. Have you ever received assurances from the Saudi lobbyists that they're working on the return of your children and that the Saudi government was working in good faith and what was really going on? No, They've continually betrayed me and deceived me, and they, the Saudi government and their paid mouthpieces have worked hand-in-hand hand for 17 years to keep me from my daughters. Let me ask both of you uh, this question. Is it, it's my understanding that both of you have been threatened by, in the past by Saudi lobbyists. Can you tell us how they were threatening you? Uh, they have threatened us uh, via email. Um, they have threatened us with uh, legal action on occasion uh, if we did not drop boycotts that we were involved in. Um, and they just uh, boycotted our press conference that we had here in Washington. Uh, that was kind of an implied threat, I felt. Yes, when we were dealing with Hill and Knowlton, uh, the torture lobbyists in Washington, they sent me a letter that is included in the file uh, that saying they were going to sue me because, in fact, they did not represent the Saudi government, which I sent a letter back to them stating uh, under in the book Agents of Influence by Pat Choate in 1990, they were listed as not only representing the Saudi Arabian government, but Prince Talal and Adnan Khashoggi. Did, uh, did the lobbyists from Hill and Knowlton uh, lie to you regarding their relationship with the Saudi government? That's what you just commented about. They yes, did lie they, to you. they lied, blatantly lied. You believe that permanent damage was done to your daughters by what happened on August 31st in London, correct? Oh, sir. Sir, what, what they did to my daughters in London is unspeakable. It's inhuman. It's these people, Petrozolo and et cetera. They, they should be held responsible for what they did to my daughters and uh, let alone what they did to me that weekend. I, I truly thought that this was all coming down around me, all my work to get my daughters back. But never mind what they did to me. I, I can't even imagine Alia and Aisha and Alia's baby in, in, the, in that hotel room in London and that woman from Corvus was there and they were coordinating all this and O'Reilly's producer. And, and they knew they were in a free country and they couldn't get out. And they were forced to say things against their mom again and again and again. And then they were taken back to, to Saudi Arabia knowing full well that they couldn't get out. They, they knew that that was a chance. Alia did. Aisha was probably so confused by it all. But certainly Alia knew what was happening. And it's frightful to, to realize the power of the Saudi Arabian government and the power of these lobbyists how they manipulate, how they manipulated my daughters. 
it's, it's unspeakable and it's against all of our laws and the laws of the Lord. Do you think it's important that we obtain the documents from the lobbyists so that we can see what was really going on and why they sent your daughters to London? I think that's exactly true. I think it's so important because they're, they're hiding so much about the interference, the participation of the public relations firms with what happened not only in the very past past but also concerning this whole um, scheme, this whole Stalinistic show trial in London. Um, I mean, I think there are documents there. It's my belief, sir, that there are such incriminating documentation that they might even be able to go to jail because of what they did. The Saudis claim that they're trying to resolve the kidnapping of your daughter, Ms. McLean. Uh, have you seen any evidence of that? I have not seen any evidence that they're trying to resolve this. Um, I just found out from an article on the Internet that they had told uh, Patton Boggs to go ahead and try to resolve these. I haven't had any calls from Patton Boggs saying we'd like to work with you on this. So the answer is no. The Saudis and the U.S. State Department deny that the Saudi Embassy was complicit in your daughter's kidnapping. Uh, do you believe them? That is patently false. Um, Several years before my daughter was ever kidnapped, I sent all my legal documents to Prince Bandar, to all the uh, Saudi consulates in the United States. I believe there's one in Houston at the time, and I think the other one was in Los Angeles. Uh, they all have those documents. I sent them registered. I sent them certified. I had them translated into Arabic so they knew exactly what they said. And I said, um, this child does not have permission from me or from the court to leave the United States of America with her father. And uh, Prince Bondar knew that. So the, so the State Department, when they say they have no evidence that, uh, that, uh, this, uh, uh, that the Saudis uh, were complicit, is, is the State Department must have their eyes covered. I don't know if the State Department has that evidence or not. Um, I've told the State Department. I don't know if the Saudis have turned those documents over to the State Department or shared that information with them. But... Um, but you think the State Department ought to help us in our quest to get these documents from the public relations firms so that we can check that out? Definitely. The State Department, the Justice Department, um, the FBI needs to get involved in this. I don't think this is any less bad than uh, embassy officials writing letters and checks to terrorists. Um, I, you know, to me, this is just as bad. My children are victims of terrorism. It's well, worse. It involves our flesh and blood. Let me just end up by saying uh, that, uh, and I want to thank my staff for all the hard work they've been doing on this. Uh, Jim and David and Kevin, you guys work very hard, and I really appreciate it. You guys ought to give them uh, a pat on the back when you get a chance. Let me end up by saying this. Uh, we're at the end of the year, and I see some of the lawyers for the public relations firms out there, and I'm sure that they understand that at the end of a session like this, it's hard to go ahead and uh, get legal actions taken. And so uh, I'm, I'm confident that they feel they can run out the clock on us. But it isn't going to work because uh, we're going to continue this next year. We now have the Senate that's going to work with us. And uh, I promise you that uh, we will continue to beat on this issue until something is resolved. And, and the people who are getting two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a month or however much they get representing the Saudis need to give them some good advice, and that is resolve these cases. Show the American people and these mothers that they really do want to solve these problems and do care. And that the Wahhabis over there are not uh, controlling the government, as many of us, myself included, think that they, they are to a large degree. And that they're going to be concerned about the human rights and the rights of American citizens who've been kidnapped here in the United States and taken overseas. Uh, so uh, this isn't going to go away. It's something that will continue. I won't be chairman next year, but uh, I don't know if you guys know much about me, but uh, I won't uh, keep my light hidden under a basket, and I'll make sure that we push the right buttons to continue to move this thing forward. So you ladies, don't give up hope. There's still uh, still some good possibility that we'll get this thing resolved eventually. And with that, thank you all for being here. We stand adjourned.
Another in a series of government hearings on child custody disputes. If you'd like to see this hearing again, it'll be available to you in about 30 minutes on our website, and that's cspan.org. So right now, we're going to take you live to the White House for today's briefing with presidential spokesman.